At the present time the coronation of Charles III is the Rome towards which all roads lead. And if a walk down Oxford lands us among coronation cuffs and collars and soaps and souvenirs it is only to be expected. For of all the survivals with which we are surrounded in this conservative country, the coronation ceremonies, though shorn of much of their grandeur and significance during the last hundred years, are still the most unchanged in spirit and in detail. The proceedings in connection with the coronation of our medieval kings began at the Tower. Very significant was it that before taking formal possession of his throne the king took practical possession of the fortress. But if his claim to the crown rested partly on force and the strong hand, it rested also upon the elective will of the people, and accordingly, on the day before the coronation the king rode from the tower to Westminster Palace to show himself to his subjects that they might see what sort of man it was whom they were choosing for king. Naturally the processional ride was made as magnificent and impressive as possible. With the king went a crowd of nobles, all on horseback, conspicuous amongst them being the recipients of coronation honours, the new-made knights of the bath, usually thirty or forty in number, upon whom the honour of knighthood had been bestowed, with the accompaniment of scarlet furred robes and other gifts of apparel, the previous day. Richard III whose cavalcade eclipsed the splendour of his predecessors, was accompanied by three dukes, nine earls, and a hundred knights and lords, all gorgeously attired. Nor did Henry VII though careful and even parsimonious in most matters, spare expense over his procession. He himself was arrayed in rich cloth of gold of a purple ground of which ten yards were bought at the prodigious price of eight pounds the yard, the trapper, or caparison, of his charger was made of crimson damask cloth of gold, costing eighty pounds and either this or another trapper was adorned with one hundred and two silver gilt portcullis. Over the king's head was a canopy of cloth of gold, the gilded staves of which were carried by relays of knights, changed at frequent intervals that many might partake of the honourable but arduous duty, and in attendance on him were the henksmen, dressed in crimson satin and white cloth of gold embroidered with the royal arms. The henchmen led the spare charger which for some reason always formed part of the royal procession. It was, possibly, for this state charger that the trappers of St. George were made, of white cloth of gold, but the trapper of blue velvet with one hundred and two red roses worked with Venice gold and dragons of red velvet, and the other trapper with the arms of Cadwallader, clearly belonged to the Queen's portion of the procession. She was clad in white damask cloth of gold, reclining on cushions of the same material in a litter drawn by two horses with white harness and trappings, under a canopy of white damask with silver staves. Five henchmen in crimson and blue led her palfrey of estate, then came three chires, or carriages, each containing four ladies and draped in crimson, and then seven ladies in blue velvet purfelled with crimson satin, riding on palfreys all of one color with harness of crimson cloth of gold, her suite displaying a splendor of color which formed an excellent foil to her own silvery radiance. Our sovereigns no longer start from a fortress to ascend the throne, and they show themselves to their loyal subjects after they have been crowned instead of before the ceremony, not from any fear that they may prove unacceptable to the people, but because none would dream of challenging their right. But if Buckingham Palace is a less satisfactory starting point than the Tower, there are some things in which we have improved upon our ancestors. Chief amongst these are the police arrangements. It is no longer necessary to proclaim, as was done when Edward II was crowned, that no one shall dare to carry sword, or pointed knife, or dagger, mace or club, or other arms on pain of imprisonment for a year and a day. Nor is the threat of a similar penalty needed to ensure the polite treatment of foreigners attending the coronation. On the other hand, we are spared such disastrous overcrowding as occurred at the coronation of Edward II when the king had to go out of his palace by the back door to avoid the crush, and by the pressure of the crowd within the abbey a stout earthen wall was broken down, a prominent citizen crushed to death, and the area reserved for the ceremony invaded. Within the abbey, at the crossing of the transepts, a high stage had to be erected for the chair of state, where the king sat in full view of the people during the first part of the service. This stage was covered with rugs and hung round with silken cloth of gold, the chair of state being also provided with a golden canopy, and silken cushions. The king, after his ride to Westminster Palace, partook of a light supper and retired to his chamber. 
If he had not already been knighted he prepared for that ceremony, a usual though not invariable preliminary to coronation, by keeping vigil. On the morning of the coronation day the king, after the ceremonial bath, put on spotless raiment, to signify that as his body glistens with the washing and the beauty of his vestments so may his soul shine, and went into Westminster Hall, where he was lifted by his lords into his throne. Presently the royal procession, the king walking barefoot and the various nobles carrying the regalia, started down the covered way, and were met by the monks and clergy, and by them conducted into the abbey. The ceremonial investiture was performed with the regalia of St. Edward, preserved in the abbey treasury and regarded as too sacred for lay hands to touch, so that in the procession they were carried set out upon a covered board, but before the close of the service the king laid aside the crown of St. Edward and assumed his royal crown. This did not resemble the glittering monstrosity with which we now render our sovereign's heads uncomfortable and slightly absurd, but was a dignified and artistic circlet of the type known to heraldic writers as a ducal coronet. Edward III had three crowns, all of gold, the chief, described in 1356 as lately pawned in Flanders, with eight fleur-de-lis of rubies and emeralds with four great orient pearls and eight sprays of ballas rubies and orient sapphires, the second, given to Queen Philippa, had ten fleur-de-lis of rubies and emeralds with groups of emeralds and six pearls, the third was not, strictly speaking, a crown, but a chaplet being an unflowered circlet with nine groups of great oriental pearls and in the midst a beautiful ruby. Wearing his crown and attended by his nobles bearing the other insignia of royalty, the newly anointed king returned to Westminster Palace for the great business of the coronation banquet. For this event Westminster Hall was prepared, a throne, being set for the king at the upper end, covered with Turkish cloth of gold, or other handsome material, with a canopy. When the guests were seated in their order of precedence, and the Earl Marshal and his attendants had ridden up and down the hall to make room for the attendants, the banquet began, and during its course a number of nobles and lords of manners had the duty or privilege of discharging various services to the king, receiving as a rule valuable perquisites. Thus the table had been laid by the Lord of Kibworth Beauchamp Manor, in return for which service he kept the salt cellar, knives and spoons, the cloths and napkins had been provided by the Lord of Ashley in Essex, as chief Napier, and remained his property. The important post of chief butler was filled by the Earl of Arundel, though at the coronation of Queen Eleanor, in 1236, his place was taken by the Earl of Surrey, as he had been excommunicated by the Archbishop of Canterbury in a quarrel over sporting rights, but the Lord of Womanly had the privilege of passing the first cup of wine to the King, and then withdrew in favour of the Mayor of London, who acted as chief cupbearer, not without reward. For at the coronation feast of Edward III the Mayor received as his fee a gold cup enamelled with the royal arms, and a gold water spout pot, ornamented with enamel and two Scottish pearls. At the same feast the Earl of Lancaster as steward secured four silver charges stamped with the arms of Hartley, and four others bearing the badge of the Countess of Hereford, ten silver skewers, and eight sauce boats, each marked with the royal leopard, and the Chamberlain carried off two basins parcel gilt and enameled with the arms of England and Scotland. The Lord of Addington supplied a dish of gruel and the Lord of Liston in Essex wafers, other persons brought water and held basins and towels, and the head of the family of Dymoke of Scrivelsby rode into the hall in full armour, with his punning crest of a moke's ears on his helm, and offered to fight any one who would deny the king's sovereignty. But after all the main thing at a feast is the food. And that was plentiful. For his coronation feast Edward I sent out orders to the sheriffs of the different counties to provide 27,800 chickens, 540 oxen, about a thousand pigs and 250 sheep, besides instructing the prelates to send up as many swans, peacocks, cranes, rabbits, and kids as possible, and also giving large orders for salmon, pike, eels, and lampreys. 